facilitate by asking the first question. Um, as an organizer, I've experienced a lack of enthusiasm from internationals to mobilize organizing campaigns in lower income shops. Can you talk about the importance of unionizing lower income workplaces as well as shops that offer middle class sustaining wages? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I can. Most of our organizing is in um, poverty wage work of janitors, security officers, nursing home workers, home care, child care, fast food, the workers you just heard me talk about. And I think what's happened in the American labor movement is because the original organizing was catalyzed by industrial workers who were also in poverty wage jobs before they became union jobs, and the employers in steel, rubber, and auto made different decisions. Um, I think the trade union movement got spent a lot of time in the industrial sector and didn't move as the economy moved in the same way that we're trying to catch up with the movement to the gig economy in our organizing. And so I think more and more, like we're doing work with the communications workers who are doing a lot of poverty wage work organizing with Verizon workers and with uh, federally subcontracted call center. Mm. Uh, workers. Uh, the Unite Here is doing a lot of work in airline catering. So I think we're beginning to see a trend toward it. And then I think the teachers' uprisings, the student uprising, the Me Too movement, the Dreamers, Black Lives Matter, all of these other movements are encouraging workers who think there is no path to imagine, yes, maybe I should walk through the door and strike, even if I don't have the protection of a contract, um, because I see other people joining together and making things better. That's great, and I'll encourage folks that there's still time if people wanna enter questions in on Slido. Um, another question we have here about gig workers um, in, in California. So you mentioned uh, the movement to try to expand access to unions and uh, there's an ongoing battle, as you know, in California about this. If you had to project forward, the question is, um, one year from now, will Uber and Lyft drivers be unionized employees, non-unionized independent contractors, or something else? Yeah, there's great organizing happening in three different ways in the transportation sector with Uber and Lyft. One of our locals is backing a organization called the Mobile Workers Alliance, and our local union has said, maybe we shouldn't be the bargaining representative, but we should help the, the workers make a demand on those two companies. They're aligned with an independent organization called uh, Mobile uh, Rideshare Drivers United, I think. And that's then um, connected to a 501c3 that's organizing in Northern California. So these are three different kinds of organizations operating in this sector, and we're trying to create a uh, coalition. And my deep hope is that the answer to that question will be yes, but I really want us to think in California about the 1.8 million workers that are operating in this sector and how to use the transportation network agreement to create a framework for the entire sector of delivery workers, because I think people know uh, people have to skate between all these jobs in order to make a living. And so we've experienced our home care members doing lift work in their off time. Like, we're doing a survey now of our service workers, and we think close to 20% are in the gig economy trying to make ends meet. So we just are trying to figure out how to help the institutional labor movement get creative in thinking about not applying our 20th century bargaining model to this 21st century economy and listening to what matters most for these workers, because it's different. 20% um, are full time and earning a living off of these jobs, 80% are contingent. So it's a very different way to think about bargaining than what we normally have done. And I guess as a follow up to that, I mean, how do you think, you mentioned the, some 501c3s who are in this space, how do you think about these worker organizations that have um, po popped up in places where there haven't been unions, and to what extent more, are those? More, yeah, more. to what extent do you see those as collaborators and as potential partners versus competitors? Yeah, in the, in I actually think um, whatever form the organization takes, as long as working people can join together to bargain a better life, the better, and that we need to welcome the innovation as a labor movement. And I think 
the extent we can, if we can help finance the innovation. Sometimes these new organizations in the economy help us imagine a future uh, that our members might be scared of or our members might be more attracted to. Whatever it is, uh, because of the dramatic shifts that are occurring in the economy and because we believe so fiercely in the ability of people to join together and bargain a better life, we have to be open to all different forms. That's great. And actually, I think you might have come in after Carmen Rojas spoke, but she spoke yeah. this morning about the workers' lab and the role that SEIU played in seeding the innovation yeah. that they've been yeah. um, experimenting with. And not without controversy, I want to say. <laughs> like, there are still leaders in our union that don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. and, um, but we voted as an organization through a democratic process that we needed to invest in new forms, and so we're doing it. But I just want to... Again, that's the wonderful thing about a labor movement in my mind. You know, the majority, there's processes, we debate, we decide, we roll, you know? And um, it would be great if we could return that sort of basic principle into our democracy as well. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the short time we have remaining, I think maybe we can do one more question. Um, and let's see, how do unions support grassroots movements like wildcat strikes in right-to-work states? We talked a little bit about the role of strikes, but in the particularly hostile environments. So that's a question that I could answer much more freely if I wasn't on the record. Because the, the institutional labor movement has rules about the degree to which we can assist. Because we can be sued under certain rules if workers walk off the job and we provide support. One. Two, if you're not the labor union that is the collective bargaining representative, you have a lot more leeway. So when West Virginia happened, when Arkansas happened, when Arizona happened, we moved SEIU staff and members into those fights because the institutions that represent the workers had a legal constraint. And so that's the biggest way, I think, is, and it wasn't just us, like there were uh, PTAs and uh, nursing home employers that released our nursing home members who were moms and dads of the students and wanted to support the uprising. Um, so it was an incredible, it's, a, it's about how do you back the demands of the people that are the most impacted and get out of the way. Um, what NEA did in Arizona I thought was incredible. The local leader of the Arizona Employee Associ Education Association stepped aside and told the 23-year-old who had built a Facebook group of 50,000 in the original Ed for Ed demand, you're in charge, tell me what you need me to do. And he kind of moved the resources of the organization, because that was not a wildcat in the way that um, West Virginia and Arkansas were initially. That was a political mobilization to demand more funding from the state legislature. And, um, Arizona Education Association now has 50,000 dues-paying members as a result. You know what I mean? Because the, the institutional leader backed the movement leader because they understood, oh, there's energy happening here. How do we get behind it and support it? And I think that's the kind of flexibility in this moment that I think is required between institutions and movements. You know what I mean? I have, I'm a president of an organization. I like to consider myself a movement leader as well, but I have obligations to protect uh, our members. And so what we, we have to get much more creative in imagining, I think this happened in the uh, ACT UP movement for the LGBT community, for the civil rights movement that was, it, there were institutions that lifted up that weren't in the front um, that allowed the, the foment. That's what I think is our job right now. That's why I say whoever wants to help organize poverty wage work in this country, come on in. Never done it before, it doesn't matter. It's more about how do we intensify the demand and call the question on corporate actors in this economy and democracy. Well said. Well, unfortunately, we're, we're out of I'm time, sorry. so that will have to be the last word, but please join me in thanking Mary Kay.
Um, and, and before we welcome our next panel, um, I've been told to direct everybody's attention to the TV screens on the side of the stage where we are um, going to be hosting a, a poll question that we hope to jumpstart the conversation in this next panel, which is about structural racism. So the question is, what policy should be the most, uh, would be the most effective at closing the racial wealth gap? Um, please enter your answer in Slido. We realize there's not one magic bullet answer, so you can put more than one word in there, and it will create a beautiful word cloud. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to the next panel. Thank, Thank you. you. Please welcome Jillian B. White, Senior Associate Editor at The Atlantic, Byron Aguist, Founder of Opportunity at Work, Camille Bousset, Director of the Race, Prosperity, and Inclusion Initiative at Brookings Institution, and Monica Garcia-Perez, 